I think when we talk about Buffalo and its blue collar roots and its loyalty to Buffalo brands, it's because we invest in our community. When, when people in Buffalo succeed, they reinvest. You know, they pay almost a Buffalo tax back into the economy of donations and supporting community organizations. And we do that and it's, it's central to what we do. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening whenever you may be listening, and welcome to Latitude. I'm Nate Benson, Director of Content here at 43 North, and we've got a great show for you this week. We've got Chris Smith. He's the Vice President and the guy that does the things at Community Beer Works. This week we're talking about Community Beer Works, their expansion on 7th Street, how they've developed from a crowdfunded brewery to now having a fantastic location in a neighborhood. They're bringing back the neighborhood bar feel, the neighborhood brew house feel. You know, Buffalo has a rich history of brew houses that were just in regular old neighborhoods. You could go on one side of town, get a you know German style ale, or you could go on the other side of town, get a Polish style. Or, You know what? Chris tells the history of Buffalo Brewing and the history of Community Beer Works way better than I do, so let's not waste another minute with me and get right down to this week's episode with Chris Smith from Community Beer Works. Chris, how are we doing today? I am doing great. It's a great day for a beer. It is. Thank you for uh, bringing many. I brought this is going to be a very interesting podcast, <laughs> yes. I think. For those who don't know you, which are a few and far between, but uh, give us the quick pitch of who you are, what you do. My name is Chris Smith. I'm one of the founding partners of Community Beer Works in Buffalo. Uh, we were one of the very first craft breweries to, to open in the, in the latest wave of craft brewery growth in America. Uh, so we have a bit of an original position in Buffalo. We've been uh, in business for six going on seven years. Wow. Um, your title is officially vice president and guy who does things, does the things rather. Does the things, yes. The, the is important. Uh, so you're literally either uh, making tough decisions or taking out the garbage, right? That's pretty much pretty much. Well, guy of that title. Most of the time in a startup, you do both. <laughs> you're right. So, yeah. Uh, I'm the guy who does the things, and my business partner, Ethan, is the guy who does the stuff. <laughs> so we, we have we have a, a bit of a two-headed leadership. Everything covered with those two titles. It is. We, <laughs> we, do, we do need a director of whatnot. We're still working on that. Interesting. I will. Uh, so you heard it here first, folks. You know, <laughs> director of whatnot, now hiring. Soon to be hitting zip recruiter. So uh, does, in fact, community beer work? Uh, I would say the beer makes a community work. There you go. There you uh, go. And that's really where we come from with who we are and what we're about. Um, you know, Ethan and I met... Uh, planning Buffalo Old Home Week uh, mm-hmm. about 10 years ago, actually more than 10 years ago now. Uh, we had both just moved back home to Buffalo. Uh, I was a system engineer at Oracle. He was a professor at Duville. And, you know, we were in that middle age cycle, you know, mid 30s of yeah. are we happy with what we're doing? And we liked beer a lot. And I'm approaching that age, the, the mid 30s <laughs> crisis. So that's this is a refreshing story. You either buy a car, a fancy car, a motorcycle or get a new job. There that seems go. to be the thing. Um, but I think, I think Ethan and I found that we both had a passion for beer, uh, and with several other partners at the start, we, we thought we'd put together a small homebrewing collective where we could all kind of hang out and share beer and uh, cut the costs of an expensive hobby, and slowly it turned into a brewery. And, you know, a lot of those original partners, uh, they weren't in it for a business. They really just sure. wanted it to be fun. They've dropped off, but Ethan and I persist, and, you know, we've... We've built a company that we've always wanted to work for, essentially. Uh, you know, I worked at Oracle and Sun Microsystems and Lockheed Martin and various terrible startups throughout the course of my life. <laughs> and I learned a lot about how not to run a company. So we thought if we, if we ran a company that paid people a living wage. That, Imagine that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as soon as we were able to pay anyone besides ourselves mm-hmm. uh and even then we were paying people before we paid ourselves uh, <laughs> like like any good founders right, right. <laughs> uh but as soon as we were able to pay salaries mm-hmm. and bring people on we were determined to do it at union rates and offer uh, a quality benefits package and create a culture uh where we worked where everyone's opinion was solicited and valued uh that everyone felt that they were a part of the effort mm-hmm. that we needed to build community in the company if we wanted to build community outside of the company. Sure. So that's one of the things I think that makes us special is really our collaborative management style inside the company. I mean, I'm the guy who does the things. Ethan's the guy who does the stuff. But we, we, we do have a traditional reporting structure in the company, but it's, it's a really fun way to, to live a life and run a company now. Just do it our way. 
Now, if my memory serves me correctly, obviously, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. It, it really was a community effort to get off the ground, right? It was a crowdsourced project, correct? It was. We, we threw our money in a bucket, um, and we bought a garage. <laughs> on, uh, like any good startup. The Lower West Side. Uh, we, 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 we struggled to think about, we, we wanted the, the brewery to be a, a neighborhood business. Because uh, historically, breweries before Prohibition were local and even neighborhood businesses. Right. There wasn't large-scale breweries. I mean, there were very few of no. those. Right? Yeah. And, and Ethan wrote a book about Buffalo's brewing history. And it's, it's telling how each neighborhood had a, a defined type of brewing culture. You know, there was Czech lagers brewed in one part of town, and there was Pilsner's brewed in another. And it was interesting. It, there was so many different local breweries. But after Prohibition, for many, many reasons that are too deep to go into here... You know, the, the scale of national breweries and paired with the arms of distributors really choked off local breweries. So where we're at is we're at a point in time where we've got to return to the mean, really. For centuries, beer was produced locally to be consumed within a week or two. Mm -hmm. uh, and really, it's supposed to be a perishable product. It's supposed to be fresh, and it should be local. So for us, that's a founding principle of who we are, and I think that's part of our culture and what makes Buffalo Brewing special. Were you surprised by the, because I remember, you know, the crowdsourcing campaign was fairly successful. Were you surprised by that? Were you surprised by kind of an outpouring of like, hey, this is a good idea? Or was, uh, were you expecting something like right. that? Right. Well, thanks for bringing me back to the original question, because I was explaining what informed it, really, is I think we, that culture exists, and it's part of Buffalo, and as soon as we asked for support from people, it was there. Yeah. It was pent-up demand for, for local beer, and... Really, you know, it, as we grow, I think we're getting past craft beer as a term, and it's more of a product mm -hmm. different. It's just a, a category, really. Yeah. Um, but what really distinguishes at this point is local beer. And I think in Buffalo, going to the community first as fundraisers um, really helped us get started and built that into the company at its base. So, you know, we, we bought what we could afford, and then we, need, we needed a little more, and the community has been for, there for us since day one, really. You know, six years later, you've got a brand new location uh, just off Niagara Street, Seventh uh, Street, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to the garage days, what were those challenges? You know, was it similar to the start, the, you know, like a tech startup working out of the garage? I mean, brewing out of the garage is probably not easy, right? Right. It isn't. Uh, it's tough to get temperature control. Uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, and we were intent on owning the company ourselves. Mm -hmm. We 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 could have gone out and solicited money, but. In the end, we were all, this was a side hustle for most of us, and two of us jumped in full time right at the start. Uh, but for us, it was, it was a side hustle, and we thought, you know, why don't, we, why don't we do this the old fashioned way? Let's brew beer. If people like it, they'll buy it. That should give us some money to make more things and just grow the business organically. And, it, you know, it did. And for us, you know, we always tried to act a little bit bigger than we were. Mm -hmm. You know, we, distribu we started distributing beer across the state very early. Um, but for what us, it was... What were the challenges for something like that? Because obviously infrastructure, you know, for shipping and, and trucking, things like that. I know there are services that assist with that, but it probably sure. wasn't easy setting all that up, right? No, the biggest challenge at that scale of the business is, is the scale itself. So we're brewing beer a barrel and a half at a time. You know, if you're familiar with kegs, the half kegs that you get at consumers or, or anywhere else, we're brewing beer, we're making three of those at a time. Yeah. Uh, the amount of labor that, and, and a weekend order is 50 to 60 of those that are at that tiny scale. So the amount of time that went into brewing that beer was significant. And we had to keep things real agile, real nimble, respond to customer trends quickly. But the margins were, were thin, and it was tough to grow the business. It took us a while to scale it. And, you know, for us, finding capital was a big challenge. Well, in kind of at the same time, this you know, the craft or local brew scenes, mm -hmm. not just here in Buffalo, but Rochester, you know, Pittsburgh, they're growing in, in each of these cities. So, you know, what, what seems like probably unique problems to you are actually probably problems all of the small breweries are experiencing, right? Yeah, it's uh, these are these are across the industry issues, uh, getting scale as quickly as possible and getting to some point where you can get to double digit margins as quickly as possible and that sounds crazy but in our industry if you know at the start the it's a capital intensive investment to yeah. begin so you know we started on the real small end and tried to work our way up and there were challenges associated with that kind of capacity expansion when we got to it uh you know we had run the business one way for so long and it's it's a complete 180 to run a production scale brewery mm -hmm. and we had to adjust on the fly while running both 
scale breweries. Uh, it's a it's a unique expansion challenge for us, and I think we've weathered, weathered it well. Yeah. What were some of those hard decisions early? Look, you know, looking back at the early days, you know, like you you mentioned, responding to the consumers, you know, when you only have the ability to make you know certain varieties at a time, like flipping is the whole company's riding on that working, right? You right. Know, if it doesn't work, all of a sudden you're screwed. Right. And, you know, we needed, so we established a good customer relationships at the start. We had really great relationships with, with Bobby Rabbit, Mr. Goodbar, and Mike Schatzel at Kohl's, and, and at the time Blue Monk and uh, Brennan's. And they, they invested in us as a brewery, essentially, by putting us on and, and keeping us there. But that pipeline, there was a lot of demand, and it helped us grow the brand and the brewery. But at the same time, it took so much of our labor to keep those taps full. And it was, I mean, we were talking about 10 taps we were trying to keep full at the time. And I think it's hysterical looking back on <laughs> what a struggle it was. Uh, you know, we make beer, you know, 40, 20 and 40 barrels at a time now. It's way, yeah. it's way better. So <laughs> was, that was my next question. So, you know, right, keeping but, 10 taps open now versus how many taps now? Right. But trying to find a balance between having your core brands in the marketplace with these dedicated customers that, that want to support you while meeting customer trends and being able to develop new beers on the fly. Mm -hmm. It's a real dif difficult thing to do at a real small scale. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to start a brewery. Uh, I don't think anyone really does it our way anymore. It's, it's pretty much a venture capital dominated sure. industry now. So, cause there's a lot of money to be made if you do it right. Right. And, you know, it's, I think we're one of the last of a, a small business breed in this brewery industry. There's a few left in Buffalo. There's the Buffalo Brewing Company, West Shore, but really, this is an, it's, it's a it's an industry that's changed rapidly. Has a, has a community like Buffalo in similar size cities have they kind of reached the you know beer capacity, so to speak? It seems like at, at the height, you know, we've been, we're around 30 breweries, and I think we're lower in the low 20s now. Right. Um, are, have we peaked, or are we kind of at a comfortable number that's sustainable? Like, you know, what are you seeing from, like, a number standpoint? We, we get asked that a lot, and, you know, when we went through our investment round, that was a big question. You know, yeah. aside from our ability to execute on a plan, you know, is the market what you think it is? Mm -hmm. And going back to my earlier point about the number of breweries that existed before Prohibition, now think about the number of people that were in America at the time. Yeah. Per capita, there was twice as many breweries before Prohibition as there are today. Mm -hmm. And we have 6,000 breweries in America today, just over that. Uh, 3,000 of which, which have come online in the last 10 years. So what's interesting is not all of those breweries are trying to grow into Sam Adams mm -hmm. or, or even Southern Tier or even Ellicottville size. They're really looking to stay in the thousand to fifteen hundred barrel range which is a small brew pub but your margins are best when you're selling beer over the bar uh you know you're bringing people into your business for them to experience it your way and you're defining the customer experience and you're not relying on external partners so a good per a good percentage of new breweries like the other half model uh i don't know if you're familiar with that brewery mm. Uh, they're kind of an it brewery down in Brooklyn. They make great okay. beer. Uh, they're one of the leaders in the New England IPA space, uh, Haze Bomb type beers. Uh, but they don't have a distributor. They only sell beer in cans out, of, out the doors of their brewery. And then last year they started just traveling with a truck, selling mm -hmm. beers off the back of a truck. Well, this, this model's been embraced by hundreds of breweries now, and that means more breweries open because they're in charge of their own channel. Right. So... You know, Big Ditch, Resurgence, us, you know, we've all signed on with distributors. We want packaged product. We've grown it a different way. But I think the new wave of breweries and the growing number is really just taproom centric. And there's plenty of room for that. Was part of your decision when you opened the 7th Street uh, Brewery, you know, now you're offering food, you're offering more of an experience coming in there. Was that part of it so, like, you can kind of control? Obviously, you're distributing, but you also want people to make it a destination to come experience Community Beer Works? It is. I, I think we, we offer some unique things as a brand. I think we have uh, a, a real progressive company, and we like to share in our values with people. And I think when we talk about Buffalo and its blue collar roots and its loyalty to Buffalo brands. It's because we invest in our community. When, when people in Buffalo succeed, they reinvest. You know, they pay almost a Buffalo tax back into the economy of donations and supporting community organizations. And we do that, and it's it's central to what we do. It communities in our name, and that's what we do. And and we want people to understand that. We want them to feel it. And I think you feel it best when you're in our in our house. And you know, we introduce people to who we are what we do, what we do with our money, you know, what our, what our company's like. And I think it helps people understand who we are. And it's a unique bonding experience, if you will, with, with your customer that 
a lot of brands wish they could have. You know, looking back when you and Ethan kind of decide to take this on full time and you're establishing your goals as a you know, startup brewery, do those goals match up with what you're you're seeing in terms of results now, or did you guys pivot? You know, did you have to make you know hard decisions about a pivot or at any point, or you know, was this kind of always the plan to you know you know go from you know the growlers that people are lining up for to now distributed cans and now a brew pub uh, on Seventh Street? I think you know where we started. We we envisioned uh, a much different business than we ended up with. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think we ever intended to be a packaging brewery. I don't think we ever intended to be anything. And that's really, for us, we chase what feels right. And we're a gut-based business, and we make big bets on things. And sometimes we fail. And but failure is just an opportunity to improve. So for us, you know, where we are today, the only commitment we had was to each other and to run a run a business the right way. And we thought if we if we act with integrity in the community. If we if we make a quality product, if we're good corporate citizens, if we're and we and we share in our success, people will want us to succeed. They'll they'll want to be a part of that. And I think if more companies thought more broadly like that, you know, this would be a better community, and it would also make for better relationships amongst all of us. I think it's it. I don't want it to sound trite, but it's really just about for us. If we were just who we were, we thought the business would come to us. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. You know, so, you know, we believe that we make a great beer and that if we get it in front of people and we tell our story, it's going to work. And all the different plans and strategies and tactics you have along the way, you know, you can have your business plans. We sit down at the start of the year and make our sales plan. We make our marketing plan. You know, we set our budgets. But, you know, halfway through the year, we might just decide, hell, the thing's moving in a different direction and we just go chase it. And... For us, it works because we all work together as a team and we're open and communicative with each other and it's it's just a good place to be for us right now. How big is your team now? Boy, when we started, it was seven guys in a garage, uh, two of whom got paid, five which were part-time. Uh, now we're at over 45, 45 employees, wow. uh, 30 of which are full-time equivalent. So it's grown and it's grown quickly and we're really proud of that. We we. Our favorite day of the week is paycheck day. Ethan and I, is like the feeling that we have when it's just like our collective success. Everyone gets to take home a piece that week, and it's pretty great. Well, I think any founder wants that feeling of like being able to, you know, something you built is providing a living for somebody else, right? Yeah, we, we had our annual holiday party the other night, and, you know, we it was a moment where we all kind of were in one room. We're not always there. You know, we have employees that work in our tap room, in the brewery, salespeople out in the market administrative people and it's everybody's in one room and it just feels like a big family reunion every year and it's really great and they all have a lot of love for each other and I think that comes through in everything we do and I think if you can build that kind of culture in your company it's it, from the start you have to consciously make a decision to invest in people and not just in their training not just in their professional development but in them as people mm -hmm. get to know their families and bring them all in you know we do everything together it's one of those companies it's you know, it's a lot of fun. What's uh, surprised you the most uh, since you started back in 2012? Um, the value of human capital. Um, not just in, inside a company, but outside of the company. And, you know, that I, I sold software for a long time for a big, ugly corporation. <laughs> and our sales strategy was, you know... Sell, well, sell, sell. Well, it was, you know, I worked for Oracle. We walk into a room and say, what... What are you going to do? Go with Sybase? And we'd all laugh. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we knew we had the customers and, you know, we were going to manipulate them. And it was a terrible relationship. I hated being a part of that for years. And in this one, it's really about you're trying to, you're, we're trying to craft relationships with people that are bonding and, rela and lasting. You know, beer is central to the Buffalo experience. The, the third spaces of Buffalo are central to its identity. I mean, I grew up in South Buffalo. My grandfather used to walk home from work and he'd hit two or three pubs along the way. You know, he didn't drink in every one of them, but he'd stop in to talk to everybody. That's how our community was connected and beer is a part of that. Is part of, you know, where you're, you're not, you're not, you're not right there on Niagara Street, you're in the neighborhood. Right. Is, is part of that deliberate to create an experience like that? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we, where we are on Buffalo's West Side is, 
just a, it's a really special community and we're lucky to be a part of it. And when you open a big production brewery in a neighborhood, you need to spend a lot of time getting to know your neighbors so that they understand what you're doing and that you essentially have an agreement with them about how you're going to operate your business. And we took a lot of time to do that at the start. Uh, and it's paid off for us. It's, you know, the, the neighborhood has been welcoming. We've, we have everybody in the neighborhood comes in for meals and beers all the time. It's a, it's a cool thing. A, it <laughs> makes for a good neighborhood experience, which it is, does. which is kind of lost in communities nowadays. It's right. You know, I, I live in Kenmore. You know, we don't, you know, there's certainly places to go on the main strips, but there's not that neighborhood right. experience. You know, if, if, if our beer is the beer that, you know, you, you, you have when you haven't seen someone for a while, like Tom's coming into town, let's go down to CBW. Or let's go grab a beer and we're the beer you choose when, you, when you're making a plan or you're getting your friends together. For us, that feels good. I mean, I'll be in the store and I'll see someone pick our beer out of a cooler and it's still one of the coolest feelings in the world. It's like, there's 40 options and you chose mine. Thank you. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about what you're brewing, what, what's exciting about, you know, what you guys have been brewing lately and, you know, what folks can look forward to in terms of new varieties sure we've uh i like to think we've got one of the more broad portfolios for beer in town we try we strive to make as many options as possible available in our tap room we've usually got 12 to 14 beers different styles online at any time uh our, our favorite beer right now is the whale our brown ale it's uh recently available in six pack packaging at wegmans and consumers currently uh, being consumed by the host of this podcast by yes way. Very nice. And I am sharing a that IPA. Uh, it's a it's a it's a nice alternative IPA. It's a it's a little bit lower ABV, but it gives you the same hoppy punch you get at a at a higher ABV. And I don't know. I think you know people don't always want to drink a seven percent beer. Sometimes they just want to have a four percent beer or a five percent beer and have a few beers with their friends mm -hmm. and not get ob immediately obliterated. <laughs> so so we 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 try and offer this beer at a lower ABV. We still offer the higher one for when you do want to do that, but. Uh, for us, these two beers are the core of what we are, mm -hmm. uh, Whale and that IPA. Uh, and we also have a, a beer called Let's Go Pills. Uh, it was new to the market this year. Uh, we partnered with the official Bills Mafia organization, mm -hmm. although we can't say Bills Mafia because that's a <laughs> trademark term. Right. Uh, but Del Reed and the guys with 26 shirts and what they call the Buffalo fan base have raised what, half a million dollars yeah. for local charities. Yeah. So we are so proud to be partnering with them, and they, they helped hook us up with the Andre Reid Foundation, uh, who benefits from the sales of Let's Go Pills. And, you know, we've got an exciting rotation of beers that are seasonal, and then, you know, into can releases at the brewery. Uh, we're going to start rolling out some can releases at Wegmans. Uh, we've, we've just got a lot of great plans for this year. It's, we're, we're, we're settled into an expansion. You know, we've got our operations pretty well built in now. I think we're really about executing this year, you know, dialing in our beers a little bit further, you know, focusing our marketing at this point and growing the brand. Mm -hmm. So this is our first full year at big production scale. You know, we're rolling cans out. We've got three brands on the market at all times, sometimes four and five. And we roll out our seasonal IPAs and double IPAs. So it's a, it's a good time in the tap room. We're always running experimental beers and it's, uh, yeah. Did Let's Go Pills just roll out? Was that the first choice? The second you guys figured out you're doing a partnership with... Uh, yes. It just like, it's got to be that. Well, actually, the beer came first. Okay. We, uh, it came from our, our brand manager, Chris Groves. Uh, we were hanging around the office one day, and he just, just said it out loud. We should let's make, Go Pills! He said, we should make a Let's Go Pills. And everybody went, holy cow, yes, you're we right. Should. <laughs> we should. <laughs> so we immediately went and trademarked it. Of it, course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then once we did that, we started... You know, we planned the beer out, and then as we went, we thought, it, you know, if we're going to be a part of this community, and we traditionally have not been part of the sports community, mm -hmm. we're a little bit, you know, smaller brewery, yeah. uh, but if we're going to be a part of that space, we need to make an investment in that community. You can't just try and profit off it. Right. <laughs> Show up and be like, hey, we named a beer after you, buy it. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're all Bills fans. I, I grew up a Bills fan. I, I told... Uh, a story to Andre Reid about how I used to sneak into the Bills locker room when I was in high school and steal his gloves all the time. <laughs> Brian, I went to high school with Brian Polian, okay. and we used to get access to the stadium for sure. that kind of thing. And we, we've got a great relationship with Andre, and it's, 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 it's special. And I think for us, it makes that beer special. And was, was Andre mad that you were stealing his gloves? No. Because I'm he sure did, he noticed eventually. He did notice. There are literally dozens of pairs over the years. So <laughs> <But> <laughs> they were really nice. Newman gloves, the yeah. tacky grip. It was great. 
I played football too. <laughs> so, they so. Were, they were worthwhile. <laughs> if you're going to steal, you might as well steal for a purpose, right? Right. You can't just steal willy nilly. Well, because we'd go in and Brian's like, they've got boxes of these things. Seriously, they just throw, throw he just throws them away. Just take them. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked out. Um, has there been a variety that you know you fell in love with, uh, but you, you ultimately just it wasn't it just wasn't meeting expectations. You pulled the plug and like you talk a little bit about those decisions of like you know you might be committed to something, but a consumer's not might not be, and you just gotta. Got to move on from it. Well, we have two levels of that of that commitment. One is inside the brewery. So we, we make beer and we, we quality test it. And if it's not up to our standards, we let it go. Mm-hmm. And we've lost a lot of batches that way. Something might not go right in the brewing process. Some, you, know, you might not get something right. And it's, if it's palpable, to, if, we can, if we can test it during like a sensory tasting, once it's in a keg or in a can for a couple of weeks, it's only going to get more pronounced. So yeah. we, we just toss the beer. So we, we make an internal commitment to a specific standard. We have you know a blind tasting panel that evaluates the beers. Um, and then we also make a commitment to making sure that we're serving the market, the, the beers that they want we're putting out there. We try to introduce classic styles that maybe people don't consider. We're in an IPA crazy world, mm-hmm. uh, but on tap at the brewery, we have an Adam beer, a barley wine, and a Czech style dark lager. So we, we try to introduce if you, so you like this beer, maybe you'll try this one. Go a little bit further down the rabbit hole. Mm-hmm. Um, but for us, when we make a decision, we haven't had a beer hit the market where we've thought we really should pull it back. It's mm-hmm. not doing well or it's okay. not being well received. We, we've been lucky that way. Um, I think we, we try not to chase trends. So you know we don't release something until we do it well. I will say we have one beer that's really amazing and we don't know how to market it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's called Dude Incredible. It's a dark raspberry stout Mm -hmm. but it's sour and it's it's a light-bodied dark beer once people have it they're like oh wow that is an amazing beer but trying to convince someone on a menu the door is the tough part right right, you're you're at abv at 11 o'clock on a saturday and you're trying to read the list and you're like a sour dark i don't want that right now you think (laughs) you mean what yeah but we have it on at the tap room most of the time (laughs) because it's an amazing beer but it's complex and rich and you know we try that's why we try and bring people into the tap room because there's those types of beers are really are are really wonderful to explore yeah. and like there's a lot of um, flavor profile and there's a terroir to beer and there's all that and to experience it and come into a brewery tap room whether it's ours or someone else's you're gonna get that kind of experience and you're gonna learn about beer you're gonna learn about what goes into it uh, the amount of work that goes into it the craftsmanship mm-hmm. that that's in there and. You know, it's we're we're lucky right now to be at the birth of the industry in Buffalo and watch it. Just, re, I mean, we have such tremendous brewing history in this town, and to see it all happening again is is really great. And I think broadly, people are going to open their arms to it as we grow. So, what can we look forward to? Uh, I know you dabbled in it a little bit, uh, but you know, anything uh, pertinent that you know listeners should know about Community Beer Works coming up in the next uh, weeks and months? You know, we've we've got a. W- w- We've got a pension for silly antics. It's always been our kind of our stock and trade. That's right up my alley. <laughs> uh, you know, we have a we have a Pinewood Derby coming up. Uh, Get out, really? <laughs> That's fantastic. So Ethan's Ethan's son is a Boy Scout, and they've been doing the Pinewood Derby thing. And and uh, you know, we thought, why not do that for adults and have beer? Uh, we're, we're partnered with the Nickel City Con- uh, Nickel City uh, Comic Con mm-hmm. uh, for the fourth straight year. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been great for us, uh, and it's one of our favorite events of the year. And you know, we f- we find that for us as a brand, this is a side note, uh, that there's a lot of power in marketing in the niches. That if you don't have a lot of resources for broad-based brand awareness marketing, investing small amounts into as many niches as you possibly can, it's like planting future customer seeds. And for us, you know, uh, pinball, mm-hmm. uh, board games, all the things we like to do, like you know we just embraced as our community and and invested in them and now it's manifested over the years and now we're you know a a title sponsor of the nickel city comic con and we're part of that community and it feels great and the pinball community and all these other little niche communities that really just want our beer so for us this year is really about finding more of those things like embracing more of the things that we enjoy and selling beer into it and taking beer there and sharing it so that's what you have to look forward to us from, from us this year is more investment in silliness, you know, more investment in community time. You know, we've, we've offered our employees the ability to donate a lot of their time this year, their working hours uh, to local organizations. 
and our weekly fundraisers we do for everybody. So a lot. I could keep going. <laughs> well, Chris, I want to thank you for joining us on the podcast. Uh, if people want to learn more about all these things going on uh, or just want to learn more about Community Beer Works, how can they do so? Uh, communitybeerworks.com or Community Beer Works on Facebook, Community Beer on Twitter or Instagram. Thank you so much, and we'll check in with you down the road. Thank you very much. Cheers. I want to thank Chris for joining me on the show this week. Remember, head on over to the Community Beer Works website or their Facebook or social media pages and check out what they've got going on in the coming weeks and months. I want to thank everybody who listens to this podcast each and every week. We get quite a few emails from listeners. And, hey, if you want to shoot me a message or shoot me an idea for a potential uh, guest or to, I don't know, if you want to take over hosting, you know, just shoot me a message, podcast at 43north.org. We're always looking for folks to, uh, you know, send us feedback and talk to us about some ideas they may or may not have. And if you're looking for a brand new job, head on over to 43north.org slash jobs. Check out our jobs board. We have dozens of jobs posted on the jobs board. And, hey, there might be one for you. So again, 43north.org slash jobs for all of your startup tech related job needs in Buffalo. Thank you so much for listening for 43 North. I'm Nate Benson, and we'll see you at the next one.